Hello, everyone. Um, I, as Nikhil said, I'm Carrie Hooper. You can call me Hoop or Carrie or whatever, and I'm pleased to be here at BSET San Antonio. Um, big thanks to the conference organizers. They've been working hard, and, and uh, you know, a huge shout out. This took uh, quite a bit of coordination to uh, to set up. I love B sides and I love security conferences. I love that we can teach each other things and at the same time learn things uh, from different perspectives, different people in different roles. So please help me do that. Um, I hope to teach you some things during the course of this presentation, but let's engage in conversation in the breakout room. Uh, let's chat about this stuff. I would love to learn from you as well. So let me give you some context real quick. Why this topic? Why HTTP and desynchronization attacks? Well, uh, I first learned about this attack in 2019 in uh, DEF CON 27. I saw James Kettle's talk about HTTP desynchronization, and uh, I, it took me a, a while to wrap my head around it. It was kind of a complicated concept, and there were a few key details that I needed to understand about HTTP in order to fully wrap my mind around it. But later on, I saw many people at work, uh, whether for the blue teamers or red teamers alike, they didn't quite get what this was and how to exploit it. So what I wanted to do here is create like a zero to hero presentation, build up from the building blocks of the features of HTTP, introduce the desynchronization attack, and I'll give a few demos at the end. First off, uh, who am I? As I said before, I'm Kerry Hooper. You can find me, uh, I'm active on Twitter at nopantrootdance, and I'm a pen tester on a red team. I love learning, I love finding bugs, um, I love golf, I, I love finding bugs. Uh, though it doesn't happen as often as it should. Um, and I hate, absolutely hate Zoom meetings. Um, I'm one of the ones that tries to, that, that wants to go back in the office, can't wait. I'm also a veteran of the, the US Army uh, and, and combat veteran. So overview, what are we gonna, what are we gonna learn? Uh, by the end of this presentation, you, the audience, should understand, one, the, the basics of the HTTP protocol, uh, including a few of the key features of HTTP, called, chunked encoding or, or transfer encoding chunked, uh, and also HTTP pipelining. We'll discuss what is HTTP request smuggling, what is a desynchronization attack, and what does a desync between a, a front end and a back end look like. And then last, we'll have two demos. Now, four total demos will be available to you. Um, I will post the link later on, and you can download each of the demo in GIF, in GIF format. Um, that way, it might be a little bit clearer rather than transmitting over Crowdcast. We might uh, you, you might be able to get, get a little bit more from it. Ask me questions about it later on. So quickly, let's talk about HTTP and introduce it from the ground up. HTTP stands for Hypertext Transfer Protocol. The P stands for protocol, right? This is just a way of communication from generally a client to a server. And that communication happens over TCP, which means it's a stateful connection. All HTTP is engineered for is just is, is historically just a set to fetch resources in a human readable format. And when I say human readable, I don't mean that I mean that if you look at it in Wireshark or you look at an HTTP request in Netcat or, or or whatever, or through a transparent proxy such as Burp Suite or Zap, um, you can read the words and kind of understand what it's what it's saying. Generally, HTTP is going to consist of a request. Can I have this thing? Can I have my page.html? And a response, which is an HTML response. Uh, and this is a, an example of a very simple one. Uh, in addition to HTML, you might also get CSS or JavaScript. And those are constructed by the browser to form a page of what you look at on the internet. Five major components of HTTP, the method, uh, the path, the version, and the headers. Now, the method, some of y'all might know this as like the HTTP verbs or um, the, 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 you know, the, the, the method is such as get, post, options, head, there's a number of them. I could go on and on, actually probably not, but let's not. And then there's a path, and the path it represents the resource that you want. The slash is the root resource, but this could be login.html, admin.php, et cetera. And then also the version of the protocol that's self-explanatory. Now, headers, headers may appear in either requests or responses and there, there's many types of them, but all you really need to understand is that headers are essentially metadata about the communication. They don't dictate which resource. They shouldn't dictate as much what resources as you get, but, but how you should get them. Uh, and then, then last, there's the body of the HTTP request and response. And we'll, we'll cover that one later. Version 0 0.9 came out circa 1990. Um, 
and I say circa because this wasn't actually uh, like formally documented in, in a way that everyone accepted. There were different implementations of the protocols. There's no headers. There's only HTML and text. Now, features were added by various organizations, but there was extreme interoperability issues. You know, one network's requests were different than another network servers, and it really didn't work. And this, this caused uh, the, the need, the necessity for version 1.0. In 1996, RFC 1945 came out specifying this is HTTP 1.0, the standardization. Uh, for those of you that, that might not know, RFC stands for Request for Comment. And this, is this can be thought of as a written standard or guideline for the protocol. It dictates what should or shouldn't or must or must not be done when communicating via HTTP. Now, this, this standard also implemented such features as versioning. It mandated the version within the, uh, the, the initial GET request. It also um, specified how headers should work. Uh, these headers might be in requests or responses. And recall that headers are just metadata about the HTTP communication. And then last, status codes. This particular example has a 200 OK. However, some of you may, uh, may know of like 404 not found or 403 forbidden. Uh, there's a number of different status codes that mean different things. Finally, uh, we have HTTP 1.1. Uh, this was an update to the 1.0 version, and this was released in two RFCs between 1997 and 1999. And these specified such features such as uh, having a host header, uh, which is used for virtual host routing. Uh, there's content negotiation, cache control, connection reuse, the ability to use um, one TCP connection for multiple HTTP requests. And then um, what I would like to focus on is these two features, HTTP pipelining uh, and chunked encoding. And both of these features will be extremely important later on. And these are features specifically of HTTP 1.1 that when combined with certain architectures can cause a desynchronization. And some of those desynchronizations may be exploited. Next, I would be remiss if I did not talk about HTTPS, HTTP version 2, and HTTP version 3. These exist. Uh, they're, not, uh, they're not exactly pertinent to this particular discussion, but I'll cover them quickly. Uh, HTTPS is just HTTP wrapped in encryption. Recall that HTTP is just a plain text protocol, it's human readable protocol. HTTPS is a session layer transport for that clear text. That's why when you visit an HTTPS site through a transparent proxy such as Burp Suite, uh, you, can, you can see the text and it's not encrypted at all. That's because it strips the session layer transport mechanism, which may be SSL or TLS. It should be TLS nowadays, uh, but those are both session transport mechanisms. HTTP2 is also a thing. Uh, it, changes the, it changes fundamentally the way HTTP is transported, and it is not human readable, but it's much faster. Uh, it's faster because it supports data compression and header compression alike. In addition, it doesn't necessarily wait for the client to send all of the requests. If, if the client requests one thing, the server may send many, many different uh, responses, even, even without, without the corresponding requests. This is out of scope of this presentation, in addition to HTTP 3, which in fact is not actually documented in a RFC um, that, is, that is not yet out of draft status. It's not yet finalized or published. But HTTP 3 is uh, HTTP over QUIC. QUIC, uh, this was developed in Google by 20, in, in 2012. However, uh, you can think of this as like TCP 2.0. It's, it's a replacement for TCP, ideally a more secure TCP. And really cool, but I have scope in this presentation. All right, now there are a few things that we should discuss that, that we need to establish before getting into the, such a, a complex topic, such as HTTP request smuggling. And one of those is HTTP connections. The most simple connection in an HTTP request is a TCP handshake. For those of you in computer science class may know, may, may recall that it's a SYN, a SYN ACK, ACK, and that establishes the TCP handshake. Well, then there'll be an HTTP request, an HTTP response, and then, um, then a TCP termination handshake. So it's one TCP connection per HTTP request. As you can imagine, this is extremely, uh, this is extremely inefficient. So HTTP 1.1 introduced TCP connection reuse. 
And this is a much more efficient use of sockets where one TCP connection could hold many different requests and responses in succession. Now, one thing that this also allows for is HTTP pipeline, which I'll show in, in one of the images uh, in the next few slides. So this is uh, the, the least efficient method of short-lived connections. Each of those blue and yellow bands on the screen are a separate TCP established, TCP uh, you know, finalized. And so there's one HTTP request per TCP connection. Now with persistent connections or connection reuse, there's a connection established, request response, request response, request response, and then TCP uh, connection terminated. Much more efficient. However, let's go one step further. With HTTP pipelining, this makes use of the same TCP connection, but the client doesn't wait for HTTP responses. It adds yet another layer of speed. In this manner, a client can go, give me this and that and this. And then the server can take its time, parse through those requests, figure out which resources it needs to return, and then return them to the client. All right, the, the second thing we, we must discuss is HTTP architecture. And I'll briefly go over this, but this is more for the, uh, those in the audience that may not be familiar with enterprise level architecture. Typically, there's going to be more than just a browser and a web server. However, for the purpose of this presentation, Let's think of this in this kind of abstraction where there's a front end and a back end. Now, on the left hand side of the diagram, this is Port Sawyer's diagram, by the way. Uh, there's there's clients. These can be these can be users. They can be clients, but more importantly, they're they're using browsers. So these browsers make the request, and it goes through some sort of front end web mechanism or mechanisms. This might be firewall. This might be a load balancer. It could be a proxy or a web server. And then it, that front end brokers the connection to the back end, usually a web server that actually provides the resources. This kind of architecture uh, has many, uh, has many uh, pros and, and helps with the availability uh, of the platform overall. It helps with the speed of the platform overall, especially when it caches. The front end might, might cache some resources or responses. Uh, however, we're going to think of the, the abstraction in the front end and back end for the rest of this presentation. Last, uh, let's talk about transferring HTTP messages. This is the thing that I glanced over in the, uh, when I was describing the components of an HTTP message, was the HTTP body. Now, we talked about the first line. We talked about headers, which you can have one or many or none. And then finally, you have the payload, which is called the body. Now, when, when parsing these requests, the server or HTTP middleware, they need to understand where a request begins and where a request ends. Well, how they do that is, is in three main ways that I'm going to describe here. And the, the, the main way, that the, the most common way, is by looking at content length. So each of these lines in the HTTP request shown are separated by not just um, a return, but a carriage return line feed. These are two separate bytes. It's a carriage return byte and a line feed byte, which is a hex D and hex A, or colloquially, you know, slash R, slash N. So th this is important to understand. And then the, uh, the content link is, the, is, is given in a header, and that shows the number of bytes to expect. So there's 27 bytes in this particular example to expect. After the 27th byte, the message ends, and there may be a new request right after, if it's pipelined. Next, uh, multi-part form data. Those of you who have actually inspected traffic within a transparent proxy, such as Burp Suite, or even, even looked at, say, a, a file upload uh, capture in Wireshark, you may recognize this one. So each, instead of each parameter delimited by an ampersand uh, or, or having key value pairs, in multi-part form data, parameters are delimited by some sort of boundary. And this boundary is defined in the content type header. Uh, you can see the boundaries on the slides and in, in, in the slide, and, and there, it starts with the, the boundary. There's another value, and then a boundary, and then to n, it's the boundary with the dash dash. This is just another way of transmitting data, another way for the servers to interpret where a message ends. And now, last, probably the the least commonly known, and this is what's what's tripped up a lot of blue teamers and pen testers alike. Uh, HTTP message bodies have an encoding. Uh, especially this was implemented in HTTP 1.1, there's a transfer encoding chunk or, or it implements chunked encoding. 
Now, this is used when a server or a client, both can, both can send chunked encoding, uh, don't necessarily know how long the message is going to be. So it's treated more like a stream. Uh, we don't know how long the message is going to be in advance. So we keep sending bytes, keep sending bytes until you reach an end. Now, each chunk is delimited by a carriage return line feed, which is two bytes in hex. And then we have the, the chunked data. So look at the diagram, the header, which is again, metadata about the request is transfer coding chunk. That says we're doing chunked encoding in this request. And now each line has the number of bytes to expect and then a payload. In this example, line five has seven, and there's seven bytes in Mozilla. Line seven has nine and there's nine bytes in developer. And this goes and so on and so on all the way until he reaches zero. And the zero byte chunk ends the message. Zero is extremely important uh, in, in chunked encoding, and it's also extremely important to the key of how this attack works. And again, this can be in requests or responses. All right, now what we've all been waiting for, <laughs> 18 minutes in, and, and now we're finally getting to HTTP smuggling, HTTP splitting, and, and HTTP desynchronization. What are all of these? How do they relate? You may have read these terms in a blog. Uh, you may have thought, oh, no, that's too complicated, or, or looked into it and had your eyes glaze over. But, but here we're going to examine what actually these attacks look like. And, and in order to do that, let's take a look at the history. In 2005 was the first time HTTP request smuggling was actually documented and published. And this was published by Watchfire which was a security company. They published a white paper. The link is, uh, is on the slide. It's a short link, um, but redirects to cgisecurity.com. So they first uh, released research in a white paper on how to smuggle an HTTP request. And they did so um, with, a, with a certain setup that I'll, I'll, I'll get into later. But the impact was that they were able to deny service to certain web pages, and they were able to poison the web cache, which was a super cool novel technique, especially for 2005. It kind of ended there, those bugs were patched, and then it went silent for 11 years. 11 years later, Regalero at DEF CON 24 uh, gave, some, gave his presentation uh, about HTTP request smuggling, smuggling Wookiees within the HTTP protocol. This was not a popular talk, and it, I don't think it got enough of the uh, the recognition that it deserved for, for completely turning an HTTP protocol on its head. And he found vulnerabilities in, in, in Golang, Varnish, a number of other uh, both middleware and web servers. But the main thing that he was missing was a weaponization, like reliable weaponization and reliable uh, ability to detect this vulnerability from a black box perspective. He was infamously quoted as, you will not earn bounties for HTTP smuggling. James Kettle uh, proved him wrong three years later. Uh, he also goes by Albino Wax on Twitter. That's his handle. And he spoke at Black Hat 19 and DEF CON 27 three years later. And, and, and the white paper is attached here. But the, one of the novel uh, achievements of James Kettle was that he was able to code a custom tool, uh, a, a Burke Suite extension, or a series of Burke Suite extensions, that could both weaponize this and reliably detect this uh, issue, this ability to smuggle HTTP requests in and cause a desynchronization. And he, he, he earned 80K, over 80K in bug bounties. Uh, and, and he presented, he, he, he released the tools necessary, uh, all open to the public, no, no paid tools or anything. And the fact that he, he received bounties, I think, was attractive to a lot of the audience. Now, uh, two years later, this year, that brings us to this year. Last month, uh, James Kettle also published on Twitter that he has identified some uh, request smuggling vulnerabilities in HTTP2 itself, uh, which I, I'm really excited for. And in addition, Emil Lerner uh, also gave a presentation. They, they kind of had simultaneous research going towards the same, in, in the same direction. I haven't done a whole lot of research in the HTTP2 uh, request smuggling, so I don't intend to cover that over this presentation. Um, but, but just know that these exist, um, but how, however, we won't go into them today. All right, the attack. What would an attack look like when we're smuggling an HTTP request? This goes by the Watchfire example of a browser on the left side, a web proxy in the center, and then a web server on, on the, on the right-hand of the slide. So this is, again, the same sort of architecture that we've abstracted that we've been looking at. 
consider the following request. And these all three of these colored um, texts are sent by the by, by the same browser. Um, to the human eye, remember HTTP is human readable. Uh, this looks like three separate requests. There's a, a, a blue post request. There's a purple get request to poison.html, and then a, a red request down below. However, those uh, those who, who know a bit about the HTTP protocol uh, might have noticed something tricky about this request. And there's two content length headers within the blue, within the blue request. So what, what's that all about? Well, when these appliances are trying, when these appliances are parsing all of this and these, these requests are all sent one after another, they have to determine where one begins and where the other one ends. And part of how they do that, as we talked about before, or is in content length headers and transfer encoding headers. But this is just, we're just dealing with content length headers. What they found in their research was that the Sun One web proxy was programmed in such a way that would take the very last content length header that was presented and it would go by that. It would just throw out the, the, the other one. And so the web proxy saw from its perspective the blue request as, as um, the blue request as, as an entire request with the purple in its post body. It, it, it counted 44 bytes after that first carriage return line feed. And it happened, and, and the watch by engineers happened to create the purple request, which is exactly 44 bytes. So it's going to see request number one as blue purple, and then a request number two as an entirely separate HTTP request. However, all right, so yeah, there's, there's the uh, diagram of a uh, blue, purple, and then, and then red. And those are HTTP requests going down the pipe. However, the same vendor's web server interpreted it differently. It in interpreted the first header that was given and then threw out all the rest. So the web server sees this as a content length zero request, and then sees the purple and the red concatenates them together. And because of the way they engineered these requests, it was all seen as one single request. And the trick that they did was they, they created a bogus header, BLA. You'll notice that on, on line 10. And then the first line of the red request was then as a header, and it really didn't count. Then the rest of it was headers, and, and it just saw this as one complete request. So the back end web server sees this as a completely different thing. It sees request number one as blue, and request number two as the purple and red sandwiched together. OK, great. What does this actually get us? The web proxy sees a blue and a red, and the web server sees a blue and a purple. So this difference in behavior between the request number two from the proxy getting login.html and request number two from the server getting poison.html, that's going to cause an issue when there's caching involved, they found. So the attacker requests, sends this malicious request, asks for login.html, but the backend web server, it doesn't see the request for login.html. It sees a request to, for poisoning of that HTML. And if this is a 404, the web proxy is going to return not found. It, it doesn't exist on the server. However, the response is cached. Next time, when a victim goes to log in to that web page, they get a 404 not found because they, they're, they're getting the, uh, what's cached in the web proxy. Uh, pretty cool, right? So what is the actual impact? Uh, we see a denial of service. So we're able to deny people logging into this website or, or deny service to any, really any page that we can think of. And then um, there's web cache poisoning, uh, which, which we also saw as possible. All right, let's move on to uh, James Kettle's research because it's, it's, it's one of the coolest. So James Kettle took this uh, five steps further and it's quite wonderful research that he did. And if you're interested, I'd recommend reading the actual white paper that was submitted to Black Hat. So again, we're, we're smuggling HTTP in the same manner as Watchfire, except due to updates and how these HTTP uh, packets are, are handled by the different middleware and, and, the, and the front end and the back end, uh, it causes this desynchronization where one thinks that one request is being, being sent and the other thinks that another request is being sent. And they may be mismatched where one thinks there's two requests or one thinks there's three requests and sends the responses. And it causes a desynchronization and a lot of unexpected behavior. Let's go find out how that can be explored. All right, so again, we're back to the, the abstraction of we have client browsers, a front end, and a back end. 
Um, those boxes are different web requests, and they're all being shoved down the same pipe using HTTP pipelining. Uh, the front end is sending this in a way to the back end that's usually uh, chunked in coding uh, for efficiency, but, but not always. So consider an attacker. An attacker sends a malformed HTTP request. It gets shoved down the pipe. Victims send requests through the front end. It gets shoved down the pipe in the back end. And if the back end doesn't parse this exactly like the front end does, it's going to cause issues. So uh, the first example, um, uh, again, a repeat from the watch fire. Uh, why is this called a desync attack? Well, what we're doing in this example is we're going to smuggle the X, the X into the back end, and that's going to cause a desynchronization. Th this really isn't request smuggling, but um, this, this POC is a way to detect it. Uh, not, you're not going to see this on, on all implementations. Uh, th there's, a lot of, there's a lot of servers that have been patched for this, but there's also uh, a lot that are still vulnerable, and I've seen this in the wild. So the front end um, ends up processing the first content like header and sees this all as one request, the blue and the orange all one request. And the back end processes the second content length header. It sees only the blue. And where's the X go? The X is in the cache, and it's kind of in the limbo. Well, the, with the very next request, the green request, this is going to get sandwiched up behind that X, and X is going to get prepended to the victim request. And the result is going to be a 400 bad request because X post is not a valid verb. It does not comply with the RFC, you know, straight to RFC jail. Speaking of RFC jail, uh, two content length headers is also disallowed. However, a lot of the appliance, HTTP appliances are programmed in such a way that um, allow are much more lenient with this behavior because they see their job as as you know a do the job high availability system and, and you know get the information from place a to place b all right enough with the two content link headers what about transfer encoding what about chunked encoding how can this be exploited so james kettle deemed this the clte attack which is the content length Transfer encoding attack, where, where two of these, these headers, they're, they're, remember, they're meant to do the same thing. They're meant to show a web server or web appliance where one begins and the one HTTP request ends. But if both are sent, which ones are they going to choose? Well, some appliances may only use the first one. Some may only use the last one. Some may not even be aware of chunked encoding. Some may be, be programmed to not use content length at all. There's a number of different scenarios, but it's really the difference between the two. Uh, that can cause this desynchronization and cause an exploitable condition. So in this example, there's a content length header, transfer encoding header. Um, there's the zero. Remember that in chunked encoding, the zero terminates the message. However, in this example, the front end is uh, interprets this as one entire request. It prioritizes content length. Recall there's carriage return line feeds in, in between. And now when the victim sends their response, this is also going to result in an X post because the back end is transfer encoding aware, it's chunked encoding aware, it's keeping the X in limbo. What does it mean? It doesn't know. And then it's prepending that to the very next request, causing an error. All right, now the converse of this attack is the TECL, where the, the front end and the back end kind of reverse roles. In this example, the attacker again sends two requests and it smuggles or actually smuggles a request in inside. It smuggles the orange request a post to hopefully 404. Now, this is a POC that James Kettle used because the hopefully 404 is probably going to return a 404 not found because that page probably doesn't exist. So much in the same manner as before, let's count, let's count these out. We've got a content like that are four, um, but in this example, the front end prioritizes transfer encoding. And remember that transfer encoding does not end until it reaches a zero with carriage return line feed, carriage return line feed. So this entire thing is sandwiched as one request through the front end. And when it makes it to the back end, the back end doesn't know about chunk encoding. It's just a simple old Apache web server from 2010. Well, it's going to take a look at that content length of four and terminate right after the 3F there. And, and by the way, the, the 3F is the number of bytes in hex of the orange request. So the back end terminates after the 3F. It counts the 3, the F, the carriage return, and the live feed for a total of four bytes. And then it prepends that orange request on to the, the beginning of any other victim request. And what's going to happen when the victim gets the response, regardless of whether they were going to login PHP or admin.php or, or, or any, any kind of resource, 
they're going to get back on 404. Uh, they're going to get back uh, the response to hopefully 404. And in this way, the attacker can control a victim's request. Super cool stuff. Yep, any request. So uh, these are the main variants of the attacks. However, James Kettle came up with additional methods to cause that desynchronization. Many servers might reject the content length and transfer encoding traditionally. However, due to lax parsing or handling of these headers, uh, he was able to cause a desynchronization in each of these scenarios that you see on the screen. Uh, he could add X before one of the, one, you know, adding X, adding extra spaces, adding extra tabs or new lines or carriage returns. All of these succeeded in some way or another across the internet in causing a desynchronization. Uh, and some of these ended up being exploited. And the root cause for this is that the system, these systems, these HTTP systems, they have to be high availability. They're not necessarily designed for security. They're designed for performance and availability. All right, demo time. This is the, the moment probably some of you have been, been waiting for. Uh, feel free to take note of the uh, short link within the, uh, within the screen. I will publish the demos later on. Uh, you can you can find these demos uh, in GIF format at www.hooperlabs.xyz slash demos.zip. But let's let's talk through that demo first. So consider this situation: we have an attacker and a victim on the left hand side, still with our front end and back end abstraction. But in this example, the front end is disallowing uh, users to access the admin uh, resource. So we're going to demonstrate a, a controls bypass. So what will happen in the demo? An attacker is going to smuggle two requests, both the blue and the orange request, as one complete request. Uh, this is going to be done by, by kind of encompassing that orange request inside of the content length, where the front end isn't choked in coding or where. So the front end is going to treat that all as a single request. But the back end is choked in coding where, and it happens to prioritize choked in coding. So when it sees that zero followed by a carriage return line feed, carriage return line feed, it's going to say, okay, that's the first request. It's going to cache the orange and then prepend that to the very next request. Now, if the attacker can be that very next request, the, the green victim request, then the response that will be given to them will be the response to the admin server because the front end is the one that is controlling, uh, that is controlling this uh, security to the admin page. So again, to review, the front end is going to see two requests, the blue and the green. And the back end is going to see the blue and the orange. And the green request is going to be treated as, as host data. So in my opinion, a really cool example. But let's see this practically. I'm going to exit out of the presentation momentarily. And let's run the demo. All right, so the uh, the front end doesn't support, as I said before, the front end doesn't support chunk encoding. This is a blog. This is a, a blog actually created by the Portswigger team. This is the Portswigger Web Security Academy, and it's an awesome tool. It's one of the best tools I've seen for, for practicing your skills in this, and I would highly recommend making an account. So this is Burke Suite here on the, on, the, on the side of the screen there. And what I'm doing is I'm just crafting a request right now. I, I sent traffic from the browser through Burp Suite, and, and this is what an HTTP request might look like in real time. I'm using the repeater tool and crafting my own post request with a single zero in the payload. And I get a 200 OK. That's a, that's a good thing. That means it's working. Next, let's go to the admin portal. So I go to admin, and it says path admin is blocked. Well, we happen to know that this security is being, is being um, enforced by the front end. It's being enforced by the, by the proxy. So how can we smuggle something through to bypass that front end control and make that request into the back end, ultimately revealing the admin path? So I put both a content length and a transfer encoding chunk header. We include the zero in there, because remember the zero is the completion of that chunked encoding. And we're just going to smuggle an X in and see if that works. So that's good news. We got a 400 or 404, an error, and notice we're sending the request over and over and over and we're getting different responses. This is one of the hallmarks of uh, desynchronization. When you can send the same request and you're doing some smuggling behavior and, and you get different responses each time, there's clearly a desynchronization between the front end and the back end. And that's when you need to, to poke further. That's when you need to, 
uh, try to find out if it's actually exploitable. So in this case, we're going to craft our own request to the admin page and smuggle that request inside of the original request through the front end. It's going to make its way to the back end, which is chunked encoding aware. And then that response to the admin page is going to get prepended, or that, that response is going to be given to the very next victim request. In, in this example, the victim is going to be the attacker, and this is going to be a way to bypass controls. But what I'm doing here is just uh, using printf and wc uh, within, a, within bash to calculate the amount of bytes. And then I'll send that request. And so when I send it, it worked. However, it said the admin interface is only available if logged in as an administrator or requested as local host. Here's one of the cool features of request smuggling is that you can put whatever host header you want in the smuggled request. And that's what we're going to do here. We add localhost in. And the web server is not going to have any idea um, that this was a smuggled request. It's not going to have any idea that this request did not come from actual local host. So I calculate the content length of the payload again. And this will allow us to get through the front end. We send this request, causing the desynchronization. 200 means the next request will, will, will have that, the result of that desync. And there we go. We get to the admin panel. We, have full control, apparently, <laughs> according to this, uh, th this exercise. And so when you're looking for this, craft it in such a way that both the content length and transfer encoding are, are given. And what you're looking for is differences in how uh, it, you're looking for different, requests, different responses for the same input. Uh, nowhere else should you get different status codes or different responses for the same input, for the same input. And, and I think that's one of the really cool um, features of this exploitation. So we bypassed controls. We took over the admin panel. Great. Let's go to demo number two. Uh, this is, is going to demonstrate a, a session takeover. So whereas before, we were just bypassing server-side controls. Well, this bug is so, uh, is so useful that you can also exploit arbitrary victims. If we're going to demonstrate a session takeover, what will happen? Again, with the front end and the back end abstraction, we have the, uh, the little evil guy in the, in the top left. In, uh, in this example, we have the same architecture as before. However, we have access to a forum. And that forum allows comments. So again, we'll send both, uh, both the content length and the transfer coding. And we're going to smuggle that orange request in within the content length header. Again, the middleware or the front end is not chunked in coding aware. It's only going to pay attention to the content length. But the back end knows about chunk encoding and it, it prioritizes that. So we're going to do that to cause a desynchronization, prepend the orange request uh, to the front of a victim request, and it's going to cause the victim to post their own HTTP request as a comment. So the back end is going to uh, take a look at that chunk, cut it off after the zero, and then <laughs> the, the smuggled request is going to post everything as a comment. And remember, this is including all the headers. It's including the verb. It's including the host header. It's including everything, including the session cookies. And as some of you probably know, if you have the session cookies, you can completely take over an account. So let's take a look at that demo. All right, again, we have the Web Security Academy on the right-hand side. And again, and this is a blog this time, a little bit different of a web application. This front end does not support chunked encoding, but the back end uh, prioritizes chunked encoding. So we're going to smuggle a request to the back end, resulting in the victim posting a comment. In order to do that, first we routed traffic through the HTTP proxy, and we'll fill it out the comment form to kind of see what it looks like. Burp will allow us to take a look at that in plain text. So I pipe that to repeater. I'm going to change some of the tab names. Generally, I find this useful when, when testing. Uh, rename the tabs. Do your diligence, because when you come back a week later or a month later to the same project, uh, it's going to be quite difficult to understand where you left off. One thing I also like doing is deleting any of the headers that don't really make sense or, or are just extra. This helps both for POCs uh, and it helps for, for my own sanity. So uh, this is the exact same POC as last time. We have a zero and an X and a single content link, which we're going to go 200, so that's expected, until we add in that transfer encoding chunk. And now we're causing the desynchronization. And we're getting different responses for the same input. Again, this is how you detect it. This is how you detect uh, desynchronization vulnerabilities manually. 
All right. Next, um, we actually want to smuggle a the post of a comment in inside of this uh, inside of this smuggle request. So I'm going to copy and paste this into. I'm going to delete the extraneous headers again, uh, just to make things simpler. Otherwise, it's it's a it's a big long request. I'm sending my own cookie, so the attacker's cookie, and that'll authorize the victim to 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 make that post request. Note that we also use the same CSRF because it's generally tied to the user session. We have an arbitrarily uh, large content length uh, of 800, and that'll be enough room for the vic all of the victim's header, the first line, the, you know, the method, the, the path, the version, and all of this is gonna get put in the comment. We don't know how long that's gonna be. And then finally, uh, comment equals hacked, and then a colon, and then um, after after that, that will be the victim's head. So I'm going to send this a few times, and, and because <laughs> because the desynchronization is happening, I'll get delays. Uh, the the request will be well formed uh, because the smuggled request has a content length of 800, and if the very next request doesn't fit neatly into that 800 byte payload, uh, what happens is is it it hangs, and that's what we saw. So so because we're poisoning a victim's request here. What we'll be looking for is two 200 statuses in a row. Two 200 statuses in a row means we, we give the desynchronization, receive a 200. Now, if on the very next request, a victim um, is exploited with that desync, we send another, uh, another desync request, another smuggled request, and get another 200. We successfully achieved that desynchronization. We did not own ourselves, and we ended up owning this uh, random user. So you can see in the, in the in the demo, we received the users' cookies, all of their cookies, all of their headers. Um, this did not come from my host. It came from uh, a bot. So complete session takeover with this bug. Really cool stuff. Let's talk about impact. So um, targets, you cannot target someone directly unless they're the only other person in the world that's using this web server, uh, then maybe. Uh, you can target, uh, you can possibly target um, things that make automated requests. However, it's it's, it's going to be difficult. What you're doing is you're causing this desynchronization, but you're not really in control of who this exploits. One of my favorite um, impacts of this is a redirect. If you find an open redirect on a website, um, when combined with HTTP request smuggling, you can smuggle that open redirect the redirect is prepended to the victim's request, and they get arbitrarily redirected, which is super cool. Uh, same thing with cross-site scripting. If you have reflected cross-site scripting or self-cross-site scripting, you can then cause the desynchronization uh, and get that smuggled request prepended to a victim's request, and in that way, you can XSS the victim. So a lot of these smaller bugs suddenly, when combined with request smuggling, when combined with this uh, exploitable desynchronization, this can severely increase the impact of these bugs. And that's one of the things about it that I think are really cool. Uh, this is, you're only, at, you're only restricted by your own creativity as an attacker. You can cause denial of service conditions, at least for a significant portion of the user base. But you can uh, take over accounts, as we saw. You can also reveal hop-by-hop -hop headers. Uh, it, wasn't, it wasn't completely obvious in that demo. However, if the front end is, is stripping off or putting on certain um, headers that might be might contain secrets. You can also expose those with the with the same attack that we saw earlier. Uh, what tools would I use to exploit this? Well, uh, as you saw, I, I was using I was doing it manually with with Burp Suite. You can do it with both Pro or Community. Uh, both with Community is free, by the way, and, and nearly uh, every bit as good as the Pro version. Uh, I would highly recommend uh, playing around with that if you haven't. But James Kettle released two separate. Uh, two separate extensions that are, are just top notch. One is the HTTP request smuggler, which serves to detect uh, desynchronization conditions, and the Turbo Intruder. And Turbo Intruder was his solution to detecting this bug. He was able to uh, code in, in code in Turbo Intruder uh, the ability to pipeline request in a much faster fashion, so that he could be the next request to that desync, so that he could detect that desynchronization, especially in these servers that are getting a lot of traffic. Both of those are available in Burp Security, by the way. All right, detection. How the heck do we detect this? Well, the, the baseline is 
is inspect requests for RFC compliance. This is the root cause of the issue, is that messages are sent, messages are sent in a non-RFC compliant way. They don't follow the rules of the internet. And then the, the web appliances tend to try and interpret them in some ways. And it's the differences in the way that they're interpreted that are actually exploited. Uh, you can also detect this with source code analysis, but this will be extremely time intensive. It's going to be following the logic and making sure that each appliance parses in, in the way that it should and in a way that's RFC compliant. But I, I don't see that as um, as beneficial for many organizations, unless you're bug hunting, you're looking for specific vulnerability in a specific appliance. However, there are a number of mitigation techniques. Uh, number one, I would recommend using HTTP2 for backend connections. You can configure this with most web appliances, um, though there have been desynchronization or HTTP request smuggling uh, vulnerabilities recently uh, by Kettle and, um, and Amit. Um, they're, they seem to be less severe and they seem to have less impact. Uh, number two, uh, patch. If you have an appliance that is vulnerable to this, there's a good chance that there's a CVE for it, that it's been reported, and that there's a patch available. So patch your appliances. Next, strictly enforce RFC. And this is much easier said than done, uh, which is why I want to introduce uh, an AWS HTTP Desync Guardian. And this is an open source tool released by Amazon, one of the, one of the conference's sponsors, by the way. Uh, that essentially does that for you. Uh, when it boils down, to, when, it, when it boils down to it, it's taking a look at the RFC and then throwing away any packet, you know, straight to jail, uh, any packet that does not comply with the RFC. So let's review. This was a lot of information, but let's oh, let's review the the main takeaways. Number one. Uh, HTTP 1.1 added a ton of features, and that was an attempt to standardize the, the protocol. But the two main features that we were interested in were chunked encoding in, within the transfer encoding chunked uh, header, and then HTTP pipeline, which allowed which allowed a much faster transport of HTTP with one TCP connection, not waiting for response, generating all those HTTP requests down the pipeline. Next, um, we learned about smuggled requests. So smuggled requests uh, or crafted requests may cause desynchronization between web components. And this desynchronization causes unplanned behavior. And in many conditions, this behavior is exploited. So some questions for you as we as we close out. Uh, where may this behavior, where else may this behavior be found? Uh, maybe in different protocols, uh, could there be a desynchronization? Could it be in different technologies? Maybe not HTTP, but maybe maybe another protocol or another technology altogether, maybe on the operating system. Um, what about away from keyboard? Could this, could this kind of behavior be exploited in real life, uh, maybe on a social engineering engagement? Uh, and, and, and last, can your organization currently detect these types of attacks? Uh, maybe more importantly, are they even aware of this, these types of attacks? Because you know, the first, the first step is, is knowledge in, in all of this. And that, that's been my goal is to provide awareness to all of you, to give you a little bit of a hands-on demonstration on what it might look like as an attacker and, and really uh, share this cool bug that was popularized by James Kettle in 2019. This concludes my presentation. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you to the organizers. I really appreciate it. Um, I will be posting links from the presentation in the Discord chat. In addition, um, I'll be available for questions as well. Uh, thank you all for coming. I really appreciate it.